century ago, 1917, famous British mathematician biologist Darcy Thompson published a book called On Growth and Form, where he presented a number of interesting ideas which are still quite relevant to us today. One of them is the theory of transformations, where he applied mathematical uh, models and mathematical thinking to connect biological shapes, shapes of um, living organisms to each other. When he took biological shapes of existing species of crabs and leaves and other animals and plants, and he showed that by um, geometrically transforming them, he, he could connect them in logical ways, which was very interesting because he showed that the shapes, biological shapes, are not random. They are connected by mathematical logic, which to him meant the underlying physical and um, genetic principles that generated them. There is a very simple mathematical principle that he applied. In fact, he borrowed this principle from, um, from a German artist and scientist from a century before called Durrell, where he took, uh, who used uh, drawings and he used point for point, trans point for point transformations from one human head drawing to another drawing to show the relationship. And um, one of the most famous examples, Darcy Thompson, he used a head shape of the early horse ancestor, Hipparion, and he transformed it via shapes of intermediate species into the shape of a, of, of a skull of a modern horse. And this is one of the most powerful examples of, of a transformation that essentially betrays evolution, again, from a primitive form, from a timber, primitive shape, onto the modern form, onto the modern species. We're still using theory of transformations today. We call it geometric, transformation, geometric morphometrics, where we used landmarks and sometimes landmarkless approaches. And the main goal here is to understand how the biological shapes are related to each other. In our own work, we use this um, approach to understand how shapes of beaks and Darwin's finches, for example, evolve um, over time, where we applied um, so-called effluent transformations, the very transformations that, that Darcy Thompson used um, to see if they can be used to explain evolution of Darwin's finches' beak shapes. Effluent transformations are a set of hierarchical set of transformations which are used in geometry to connect geometric shapes. Um, the most simple of them is called scaling, where we take a square grid, a shape on a square grid, and you uh, stretch it or squeeze it uh, to transform that shape into another shape. Uh, the next one, which is a bit more complex, is called shear, when you take a square grid and you make it oblique. And we showed that these two transformations, scaling and shear, they could explain the all the variation of big shapes in all the Darwin's finches. In fact, they explain variation of big shapes across many of the songbirds, where the more common um, changes are based on scaling, where the beak becomes longer, becomes deeper, becomes wider. And uh, the shear-based variations, when the beak curvature is changing, are much more rare, and they tend to be running more in families or in genera, as opposed to species. We found that these two FN transformations, scaling and shear, again, the very transformations that Darcy Thompson used, could successfully explain the entire variation of very highly adapted beak shapes in Darwin's finches. During the time of Thompson, which was in early uh, 20th century, it was quite this idea that you can connect biological shapes to each other using geometry, using mathematics, was very new and very, um, very striking. And um, it took some time for, for the scientists to realize that this um, ideology could be applied more broadly than just to kind of futures and examples. Through most of the 20th century, uh, this new field of what we call now geometric morphometrics um, was very slowly developing with um, more and more uh, interesting and useful methods um, introduced by scientists. For example, one of the key, um, one of the key innovation was using um, landmarks on, placed on what we call homologous, um, homologous points, that is the same points on the animal or plants um, which are evolutionarily related, if you pl place landmarks on them, then you can um, connect these landmarks into, um, into a, what we call a wireframe frame structure and then um, see how this outline of biological object changes over time. Um, another breakthrough was that we can use theory transformations to understand how biological shape changes during development, individual development, from an embryo to all the way to adult through juvenile stages, 
And um, the fact that one can seamlessly connect biological shapes through development, and this will often be informative also to think about what happened during evolution, is a very powerful approach by itself. So it's in, a, in the recent, more recent times, the last 20, 30 years, the genetic morphometrics, um, when we used both evolutionary source of data, but also developmental from the same, uh, from the same species, is given us new insights into how evolution proceeded and, or how to interpret developmental data um, more accurately. Geometric morphometrics, again, the field which was established by Darcy Thompson, is an incredibly important uh, part of science today. We use geometric morphometrics to understand how biological shape changes, for example, from normal to abnormal in medicine. So uh, when we look at the shapes of skulls and other bones in um, in humans um, in normal conditions, but also in some of the abnormal conditions. That can be a very powerful way to understand what happened during disease. Um, again, I mentioned uh, evolutionary applications where we can compare biological shapes using genetic transformations using the same, what we call within the same morphospace. Again, the concept which was invented by Darcy Thompson, uh, genetic morphospace, uh, or morphospace is, um, is the mathematical space within which biological shapes of different organisms can be compared meaningfully because we use the same landmarks um, and um, we can understand how, uh, how particular parts of this animal or the entire animal shape changes within the same uh, geometric space. So we can use this morphospace to understand evolutionary changes. We can use the same morphospace to understand changes in development. In fact, we can combine developmental and evolutionary um, shapes together to uh, to understand um, how these two processes are related to each other. In our own work, uh, we were able to use geometric morphometrics with landmarks uh, placed on skulls of uh, multiple species of archosaurs. Um, these are animals related to birds and um, crocodilians to understand how their skull, shape change, skull shapes changed um, during evolutionary time. And by adding um, skull shapes from juveniles and embryos, we're able to show that the origin of birds uh, from reptiles, uh, from this non-avian dinosaurs, which look, look, look more like reptiles, can be best explained by a process called pedomorphism, where the, um, the descendants have the juvenile shapes of their ancestors. That is, uh, the first birds, such as Archaeopteryx, the skull shape, again, geometrically defined skull shape of first birds, is very similar to the skull shapes of the juvenile non-avian dinosaur ancestors. Um, that is the very late embryos or very early hatchlings of the non-avian um, dinosaur ancestors of, 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 of birds. And uh, this was all done within the same morphospace. space. We used the same landmarks, we placed them on uh, the same positions within the skulls of, of, of the species representing the entire lineage of archosaurs from early archosaurs through dinosaurs all the way to modern birds. And when we combined all this, uh, um, all this data in the computer, uh, within the same morphospace, it was very clear that uh, modern birds and first birds, they were in what we call the baby space, that is the, uh, the part of the morphospace which is occupied by shapes of, um, of, of embryos and juveniles of the non avian dinosaurs, which had much more reptilian appearance. Geometric morphometrics made a huge amount of progress uh, in the last 100 years since Thompson. For example, we were very active in moving from two-dimensional morphometry where we look at the outline of the skull in 2D, or outline of any particular bone, or for example, leaf shape in 2D, towards more three-dimensional, or even four-dimensional um, morphometry, where we uh, look at the um, computer tomography scans. We, we made we use x-rays to generate high-definition three-dimensional images of, um, in our work, for example, of, uh, of skulls of vertebrates, such as um, reptiles or mammals. And we place landmarks both externally on various external uh, landmarks, but also internally. That way we can understand how the, uh, the shape of this biological object changes in its full complexity in three dimensions. We can also look at the evolution in development of internal structures. For example, we can look at the uh, changes in the developing brain. We can look at the changes in the developing olfactory structures, the eyes, and see how this different internal and external parts are integrated and how they change during evolution and development together.